my dear students, <coughs> I want to welcome you uh, for this uh, uh, virtual class that we are having today. Uh, this class is basically a recorded video of my slides, my lecture slides, and I hope that uh, you will be able to attend to this class at any time, even after after this, uh, any time that you have, you will be able to access this class. Now today we are looking at uh, the African traditional worldview. But before we, we come to that, I would like to begin by giving a very brief overview about uh, worldview. Uh, worldview is uh, is a kind of a perception, the manner in which uh, people look at the world, the manner in which people look at everything in the world and how they interpret it, influenced by various factors, factors like a cultural uh, background, a religious background, educational background, uh, social groups, and many other factors <clears throat> uh, that uh, later you will be able to read from the introductory part of this class uh, can influence one's worldview. And uh, because we are Africans, even as we start to look at the bigger picture, of, uh, of this thing called worldview, it is important that we begin to look at our own, uh, we begin to look at the world from our perspective, from the African uh, perspective, and then we will be able to expand this to other, other uh, worldviews. Now, <clears throat> As we progress in this class, uh, the major uh, purpose for this class is to expose you to, uh, to the ways in which uh, different people from different walks of life uh, perceive the world, especially in a number of areas, areas like uh, uh, you know, many times people ask the question, who are we, uh, why are we here, uh, what has gone wrong with the world, what is the solution uh, to the problem of what has gone wrong with the world, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, the world is a, is a big thing. The world is a big, is a big thing. And because of that, uh, there's so many other perspectives that we have from time to time uh, about what the world is. Based on the influences that I have talked about, it can be religious influence, cultural influence, and so on and so on. And uh, in the class of understanding worldview, we'll be able to look at different uh, people's perspective about the world, the African traditional worldview, the Western worldview, the Chinese worldview, the Hindu worldview, the Islamic worldview, the Christian worldview, and many others. But the Christian worldview will be like a measuring stick, will be like a yardstick against all these other worldviews that we are going to learn. And so I welcome you to this class. That is my email address. Uh, you can use it, and my phone number is there. In the case of anything relating to this class or other issues to do with online teaching, uh, but also uh, other, other issues that you may like to raise, you can use my contacts there. I want to begin by asking uh, this question, what is Africa? I know I don't have a non-African in my class. All of you who have enrolled for this class are Africans, and I guess you could be 
able to uh, let me know what Africa is. You can think about it, you can pick a piece of paper and a pen, and as we go through this class, you can keep writing down what Africa is to you. Uh, but yes, there you are. That is the map of Africa with a lot of beautiful flags uh, for the African states. I don't know whether you are able to spot out Uganda from that map. Uh, being a very tiny country, uh, yes, actually, uh, these maps does not, I mean, this, uh, these flags does not put, uh, these flags are not put on every location where its country is. So I can see here Uganda has been placed somewhere, uh, somewhere here, Uganda is somewhere here, and it is right almost, uh, it has been put in Central Africa, but yet Uganda is supposed to be here anyway. That is not our, our, our major point here, but that is Africa, that is the map of Africa. Now the question is, is Africa merely geography? Is Africa just a geographical continent? Or Africa is something much more bigger than just a geography, something much more bigger than just uh, this map that we see here. Oh, is Africa a color, a race? When you talk about Africa, many times people think of the black uh, because they say that Africa means black. So people think about the black, but is Africa about race? Is Africa about color? The, do this color that we have, the skin color of the African people that we have, is it enough to define what Africa is? Um, I think to define Africa by color, by race, will be a very limited definition of Africa. Yes, we know that Africans, the typical Africans are people who are black, generally, or people who are dark-skinned, Actually, they say to describe someone as black is an insult, but at least someone with a dark skin like me, and maybe some of you, but you know if you look at other Africans, you go to Ethiopia, you go to Somalia, Eritrea, uh, the Northern Africa, you will find a lot of people of color, people who are not necessarily dark skinned like me, you will find them in Africa. You go to Kenya, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, uh, especially South Africa. You will find a lot more people of, 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 of color, people who are not dark skinned. So is Africa just color? Maybe yes, maybe not. Is Africa just about culture? You know, when we talk of African culture, I don't know what we mean, but is Africa about culture? If Africa is about culture, then is there a unified African culture that we can talk about? Or is Africa about values, the values that are being held in Africa? I know many of us are passionate about the African value, uh, the African way of life. So what exactly is Africa? What defines Africa? So when we talk about Africa, we should be able to ask uh, some of these questions. I will say, yes, Africa is all these things. Africa is geography, uh, because there is a ge geographical location of Africa. We can definitely draw the map of Africa and say this is Africa. But remember, the Africans who are not in Africa, the Africans who are in America, then big numbers in Jamaica and elsewhere. Is Africa about color and race? Yes, many Africans are dark-skinned people. But also, Africans are not all dark-skinned. The Africans who are, who are of color, I told you, the Arabs in North Africa, even the Somalis and so on. Even for us here in Uganda, uh, there are some people who are not dark-skinned. Among us, Lubaras, some people are gifted, they have light-skinned. Is Africa about culture? about values, uh, what is Africa? That is a big question that I want to say that you must keep searching for.
if we talk about Africa, what exactly do we mean? Well, that may not be uh, so much issue of our class here, but it is good for you to be able to understand uh, what Africa is. But for today, uh, when we talk about Africa, especially when we talk about the traditional African worldview, uh, there are some key elements that many scholars agree that can define the traditional African people, that can define the traditional, the manner in which the traditional African view the world. And uh, someone called O'Donovan, he has written a book, and his book is one of the popular books read uh, when it comes to talking about the traditional uh, African people, or when it comes to talking about generally the African people. And this is what O'Donovan uh, writes in his book. O'Donovan has given seven basic elements of the African traditional worldview. And these are things that I would like you to take note about. Number one, O'Donovan talks about a life being lived in a community in Africa. In Africa, people live in a community. There is no one who lives his life singly, or there is no one who lives his life individually, but rather life is lived in a community. Life is lived uh, together. And so everyone finds identity and meaning in a community. For me, I find identity uh, primarily as being a Madi, and so the Madi is my bigger community. But also, apart from me being a Madi, maybe what about my clan? What about my bigger uh, sub clan? You see? So you find that every African has a very, a very big identity, and that identity is usually linked to the tribal sentiments, the tribal uh, backgrounds from where we come. So life is lived in a community. Uh, this is contrasted to other, other, other worlds or other worldviews where you find that uh, uh, there is nothing like a finding identity in a community, where life is more, more or less an individ individualistic kind of life, and everyone lives his life the way he knows. And uh, I mean, God is for all, but live your life, okay? So that is it. But in Africa, life is lived in community. Identity and meaning is found in the community. You don't live your life as an individual and you think you can define yourself. You can think you can, uh, you can give a meaning to your life without, without the community. Number two, O'Donovan uh, says that the second element of the traditional African worldview is the strong relationship that exists between the living and the dead. And so the common saying that in Africa, the dead are not dead. They are the living dead. In Africa, we have a belief that even before Christianity came, there is a kind of that thinking of life after death. It may not be the Christian understanding, but at least we knew that our people who have died are not dead. They still continue to live. I know many of you who, under, uh, who took Sierra E in the secondary school must have talked a lot about this, that the dead are not, they are not dead in the traditional African worldview. Uh, but rather they continue to live. So we have Instead, we have, we have the living, which are us, the people who are now alive, and then we have the living dead, the people who have lived before us, who have died, but yet they are not dead, they are living. So there is a strong relationship between the living and the living dead. That means uh, those who are alive today, they continue to commune with the dead. That is in the traditional African uh, worldview. But also number three, in Africa, there is a, that strong existence of the relationship with the spirit world and the physical world. There is a, a kind of relationship between the spiritual world and the physical world. In other words, 
the physical world can influence the spiritual world as much as the spiritual world can influence the physical world. Uh, there are world, worlds of spirits in traditional African society uh, where uh, there is the existence of the spirit world. Uh, people know that there are things like evil spirits. People know that there are things like demons. And these demons can affect the living, but also the living uh, can affect the demons. So there is all, all the, the, the spirits, the spirit world. So there is that, uh, uh, that existence of the, of the kind of... Uh, of, uh, of 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 uh, relationship between uh, the spirit world and the physical world, and then in Africa, life is relationship oriented. It's a relationship oriented life. Uh, people treasure a lot of relationship in Africa, and these relationships are traced uh, to so many generations. You find your father's auntie, sister's daughter's son is still your relative. I don't even remember what I said. Maybe your father's auntie, sister's daughter's son. I don't know whether that is what I said in the beginning. But you find that there is a lot of attention that is being paid to relationship. And so there is a relationship-oriented life. People are happy to say that this is my cousin. Actually, even that word does not exist, cousin, in Africa. A cousin is a brother. A cousin is a sister. An uncle is a father. Especially if it is a maternal, paternal uncle, it is your father, not an uncle. And so on and so on. So relationships are very important. And as I said, these relationships are present. Uh, these relationships are kept. And in most cases, people who are related, uh, in many African traditions have got uh, taboos where people who are related don't marry each other. So even when you get a boyfriend, you get a girlfriend, the first thing that you must think about is, are you not related to me? So that is, uh, that is uh, the fourth most important uh, element of the traditional African society. Now, maybe this is less important, but uh, this is a fact of, of the colonial rule. Or don't have any things that are uh, the fifth <coughs> element of uh, traditional African worldview is the memory of colonial rule. Maybe this one must have started after the, after the colonial rule, where people still remember. People still have strong memories of the past, the colonial past. And so when people look at the world, the people still look at at, at the world, meanwhile they are cognizant of, uh, of the colonial rule. And then there is uh, this very beautiful element of the holistic view of life. In Africa, life is looked at from, as a totality. Life is looked at as one. Uh, there is no segmentation where, uh, you know, or compatibilization where uh, life is divided into into different aspects of life. You find there is a compartment for the physical life, where you talk about the body. There is a compartmentalization about the the spiritual world. So at one time you can be spiritual, but at one time you can be you can decide to choose not to be spiritual. But in Africa, it is a holistic life. Even when you go to dig, there is a spiritual aspect in the digging that you have. You go to plant, there is a spiritual aspect in it. You, you, you may have to do offerings uh, to the gods of the rains, to the gods of the fertility. So that is the spiritual aspect. Even when you are eating food, a traditional African may not pray while eating food. But a traditional African will still be cognizant of the spiritual aspects. Things like when food falls down, you don't complain. When, when you get food in your hands and it falls down, you don't complain, you don't pick it, because you know that it is your ancestors who are asking for it. You see? Spiritual part, even when you are eating food. Lastly, O'Donovan thinks that uh, uh, there is a, 
one of the elements of traditional African worldview is the emphasis on events rather than time and schedules. My friends, I can tell you in Africa, people are not bothered about time. People emphasize more on events. People are not bothered about schedules. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the wedding party begins at, at, at 2 p.m. as it is planned. What is important is that the party takes place whether it is starting at 4, whether it is starting at 3, whether it is starting at half past 2. Yes, it doesn't matter. But what is important is the party has taken place. Schedules are not so much important. I don't have to book that I want to come and see you. I just come. I don't have to. I don't need a schedule to be, uh, you know, to come to your home as a visitor. That is the traditional African uh, worldview. So there are these seven elements which are very key, and I I wouldn't like you to forget these elements because they'll become very very critical. They'll become very important for us as we progress with this class, uh, this class of today but also with this entire class of worldview. So life is lived in a community, uh, relationship-oriented life, uh, or, uh, and then there is a strong relationship between the living and the dead. Uh, there is a strong relationship between the physical world and the spiritual world. Uh, memory of the colonial rule, holistic view of life, and then the emphasis on events rather than time and schedules. Uh, now, <clears throat> the African culture is, is not a static culture. Just like another culture, cultures are dynamic. Cultures keep changing from time to time. And so even the African culture is not a dynamic culture. I mean, it's a static culture. It has kept changing. I can promise you that uh, the African culture today is not the same culture that has been there in the time of my grandfather. And I can promise you that in the next 10 years, 20 years to come, you will be able to see that the, the culture that will be lived by then will be slightly different from the culture of today. Why? Because there are so many other external factors that are coming in, but also there are those other factors from within, you know, that, that can influence the change of, uh, of culture. There are normally three sources, there are normally three uh, areas uh, or factors which can cause a cultural change. I think I've just briefly mentioned the two. But number one is uh, from within. Uh, the, the factor which, which insinuates the change of culture from within, uh, from within the culture itself. Say, for example, within the culture, you know, there are some traditional explanations which may, not, which may not hold water anymore. For example, those days, they used to tell us uh, that you don't defecate at night. That was an African uh, way of life. And, uh, you know, we, we used not to understand why they tell us don't defecate at night. But later I came to realize that one of the reasons is because those days there were no toilets, there were no latrines. So when you want to defecate, you go in the bush. And you know, of course, you cannot go at night in the bush because there may be a lot of other dangerous animals in the bush which can harm you. And so they tell you, uh, you don't defecate at night. But, you know, when those other traditional explanations no longer satisfy the experience, today people have toilets in their rooms, today people have latrines on their compounds. So. It is easier for one even to come and defecate at night. So today it is very hard for me to explain to my son that he don't defecate at night. So if there are some other things within the culture which people find they no longer satisfy, they no longer they are no longer valid, they are no longer legit, you find that such cultures will keep will automatically keep changing, and and you find that. Uh, and uh, with the time, the culture has drastically changed. And then so cultures can change when they're exposed to another culture. When cultures are exposed to other cultures. Uh, 
as far as I'm concerned, there is no culture which is landlocked. There is no culture which is in isolation. I mean, there is no culture that is an island. All cultures are exposed to other cultures, especially looking at the fact of globalization today, where people freely move. An Arab can easily come and settle in a rural here. A person like me who is it, uh, originally a Madi can come and settle among the Lubara. So you find that your culture gets exposed to other cultures. What about in school? When you come to school, you get a lot of other cultures, which are, others are taught in class by your lecturers. Other cultures, you meet them from your friends and so on. And because of that, you find that cultures, different cultures that have been exposed to others. And then you find that bit by bit, and the cultures begin to change. And then also sometimes for, from supernatural sources, uh, there are supernatural powers, there are supernatural forces which sometimes can cause our cultures to change. If there are some supernatural occurrences with a very significant impact on a given culture, and especially if that, if that impact goes against what has been believed within the culture, you'll find that uh, definitely uh, that will cause uh, a cultural change. So these are, these are the three factors or the three angles from which uh, change of culture can arise. Now, I want you to think about your, your culture, where you come from. It can be your family culture. It can be your tribal culture, it can be your clan culture, it can be your religious culture, or whatever you may think. Try to examine how these three factors are affecting your culture, how they are changing your culture. And I also would like you to look at the bigger picture of the African culture. How does the Af What are those things from within the African culture which are causing the uh, change within the African culture? What about the question of exposed the external forces from other cultures? What are those things? For example, traditionally, our people in the West Nile, Gomasi, was not our traditional wear. But with the time, because of exposure to the other cultures like the Baganda culture or the Bantu culture, now our women are being forced to put on Gomasi even where they don't know. You know, it is very interesting. Sometimes uh, you find uh, a lady does not know how to put gomasi, and so there has to be another person to dress her because she doesn't know how to put it on. But you know, this is because of exposure. We have learned from other cultures. I have sat in so many other traditional occasions like a traditional marriage, and you find people keep copying from one culture to another, from one culture to another, exposure. So, the African culture definitely will keep changing. So even as we learn about the traditional African culture, there is always the existing contemporary African culture. And this contemporary African culture will be, uh, the contemporariness will, will always depend on, on the times. The, the contemporariness today is quite different from the one of tomorrow, and so on, and so on. Now, sometimes it is easier to talk about the African culture, but it is not easy to define the African culture uh, because of the polarity of Africanness. Africa is diverse. Africa is very big. From Cairo to, to Cape Town, or from Tripoli to Cape Town, it will take you almost about six hours by flight, you know, to fly in air, by, by plane. Uganda is almost at the heart of Africa. But it takes about four hours to fly to Johannesburg. I guess it will be about five hours uh, to Cape Town. So, you can say Africa is big. Now, within this, you know, physical distance, 
There are so many other cultures that are compacted within. Uganda alone has got about 50 plus different cultures. South Sudan, 200 plus cultures, and so on and so on. So how dare we talk about African culture when there are different other smaller cultures within the African culture? It is a little bit hard to talk about the African culture, but at least there are some loose unity. There is a loose unity. There is something that if you talk about the African people, you can say, yes, at least this one cuts across the African culture. And we have already talked about the seven elements of the African worldview. Uh, although there may be distinctions, there may be smaller, smaller differences, but if you study those elements carefully and you study the African people all over carefully, you will find that these elements cut across. So there are some loose unity uh, that uh, unifies or that brings together uh, the African culture. And this uh, has to do with the, the cosmic understanding of the African people or the, the spiritual uh, systems that are existing. So the following are the basic beliefs of the African cultures, especially the belief on life. What do Africans think about life? What do Africans think about ancestors, uh, the African community, and religion? These are four key important things uh, that a kind of runs through. It's like, uh, these four are like a thread which runs through the African people, and uh, at least it, it, it puts a kind of, a, apart from the skin, it puts a kind of identity on the African people's face. That when you talk about the African understanding about life, there is a kind of uniformity. Ancestors, community, religion, and so on. So let's begin by the first one, life. What is life according to the African people? Maybe according to you, what is life? Where does life originate? What is, what is the value of life? What do we do with our life? What do you think about it? Maybe, can you think about it? What is it? What is life about? Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever sat and thought about what is your life about? Or you are just living without even thinking about what, what you are. You are just living your life without even thinking, uh, you know, how your life started and how your life is ending. I think life is bigger than that. It is important that you reflect about that. But for now, we are looking at the African perspective about life. Africans believe that life is a gift from God. And it is not a mistake that I have put that G in the capital letter. And then let me explain what I mean there. Uh, in African traditional life, yes, there is a plurality of gods, but Africans study source, anthropological study shows that uh, Africans actually had a view that there is a, there is a divine God, there is a, there is a, a supreme God, now, from the studies, it is shows that Africans believe that this God is the creator. And therefore, life originates from this God. Okay? Life is a gift. And it is a gift uh, from this God who is the creator. Okay? Life is a gift. And this gift is from this God who is the creator. Okay? So that is... Uh, the traditional African thinking about life. It is also believed that life is the past only physically. Yes, God is the creator, but this life is passed physically by adult members, you know, people who are adults, who are grown up. Not, 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 uh, not juniors, but adults, people who are grown up. By marriage, when they get married, through sexual intercourse, life is passed by these members of the society and life is communicated by social contract. Uh, there is a way, there is a social contract uh, 
that that is that that binds the community in which life is lived. So life is created by God, but it is a past. Human beings are just channels through which uh, this life is passed. But it is not your parents. It is not your your parents who are your creators. African Africans believe that life is be the gift of life is beyond human beings' ability to to do it. But it is being passed through uh, that. Now each member is initiated to become a useful member of the society. So there are lots of initiation rights at various stages. So one is initiated through uh, initiation rights like uh, at birth, someone can be initiated to become a member of the society. At some stage, someone may be initiated into adulthood. At some stage, someone may be initiated into marriage. At some stage, someone may be, even when someone dies, there is an initiation into the spiritual life. I mean, in, yeah, into the spiritual world. And these initiations are done through teachings, through traditions, through uh, stories, myths, legends, peer groups, rites, songs, and so on and so on. Number two, uh, in the African culture, ancestors hold a very important place in, in the community. And what ancestors? Ancestors are people who have lived their life with meaning. People who have lived their life with uh, people who have lived their life responsibly. People who have lived their life very responsibly. That they have, even if they have died, they continue to relate with the living. They continue to relate with the living, and they relate positively with the living. There are people who have lived their life here on earth responsibly. That even when they die, the community still needs in them. So the society is made up of the living and the living dead. There are those who have died, but they are part of the society, and there are those who are still alive. But also you find that it is extended to those who are yet unborn. Especially if a woman has conceived, the unborn still is part of the society. So the living dead are channels to the living God. The ancestors become channels to the living God. If people want to communicate to God, Africans believe that God is transcendent. I will not talk about that. God is very far away. This supreme God who has created us, the creator, is very far, very, very, very far from us. But for us to be able to link with him, we must use our ancestors. So the ancestors uh, become channels of communication. Some ancestors are men and women of status who distinguish themselves when they were still alive. Uh, this distinction can be either people who are good in hunting, uh, people who are good in fishing, uh, people who are, who are good in war, uh, people who are good in public opinion, uh, people who elders who have been good in leadership, uh, and so on and so on. So when such people die, they pass into the spiritual world and they become ancestors. Men and women of status. My friend, today people live their life uh, without considering the status in which they are. I want to ask you, even if it is not for the fear of other things, you must know that even from an African perspective, our people treasure status. Live your life well, my brother, my sister. Even if it is not for the sake of the religious views, live your life well. Maybe I make a joke so that you can become an ancestor for your grandchildren to come in the future. It's a joke. Now, uh, people who ancestors are people who significantly contributed to the progress of their society. As I say, either they are good farmers, they produce enough food for people to eat, or they are fought wars and they have defeated enemies, or they are, they are, they are giants in, 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 in hunting, and so on. Those are the ancestors. Number three, the communities. In Africa, communities are organized 
at uh, at different clusters, starting from the family, it goes to the sub clan, it goes to the clans, it goes to tribes, kingdoms, nations, and so on and so on. I come from a smaller. I come from a family of about eleven people. Uh, we are we are nine siblings, and then my parents are two, so we are we are eleven biological family uh, nuclear family members. But in addition to that, we had extended members of our family. So at one point we can be we could be actually sixteen in our family. So that is the first cluster of the human society, and then you come to the sub clan. You know the immediate. The immediate relatives that you have here, uh, especially the descendants of your grandfathers, where you have your uncles, your uncles have their sons, they have their daughters, and so on and so on. And then you have the, the sub clan makes up the clan. And then sometimes the clans will form to, to have a kind of a sub tribe, and then you have the bigger tribe. For example, now the Lubara people, Lubara is a bigger tribe. So you find there is the Vora, there is the Maracha, there is the Terego, there is the Aivu, and so on, you know. Uh, and, and these different bigger uh, uh, groupings are not clans. They are not. They are not even tribes. It's Lobara, which is a tribe. But then you, you find that there's those other sub-tribes. And then we have kingdoms. Traditional Africans were organized in the kingdom system, but the other, other cultures don't have kingdoms. So we have chiefdoms. Especially in the West Nile, it is only the Aluru that has got a very strong kingdom system, but the other tribes don't have uh, really so much kingdom system, but they have chiefdom system. Although when the when the colonial masters came, they tried to put us together so that they can put uh, a kind of kingdom system where there is a chief who is in charge of even uh, some of these other tribes without kingdoms. But I think. Up now, it is still a struggle. The Lubarakar is a struggle today, even for us Madis and elsewhere, it is still a struggle. So communities were led by a council of elders. There is a council of elders who lead the community, and they reach a decision by consensus. They don't vote like today in the parliament, but public opinions or popular opinions will be agreed on by consensus. So there is a council of elders, elders who are majorly men, Women will be consulted in some issues, but the Council of Elders are majorly uh, men. Uh, kings are supported by elders, and these elders can be uh, people of religious uh, expertise. Uh, the kings also are their political leaders, their judges, they can help in certain disputes, but also they are religious experts. Uh, they also collaborate us with the ancestors and with the God. So they are the people who can help to coordinate. They do a lot of roles uh, in the traditional Africa. And life is about sharing. That is the beautiful part in the African community. Life is about sharing. We share. Someone comes to you and finds you eating. You say, welcome. Wash your hands. Join us. You share. I like today when a visitor comes, because we eat in our plates, we serve the food. Everyone has his food in his plate. A visa will come and sit. But in traditional African society, life is about sharing. Now, sharing is a very important thing, my friends. Even the Christian value, the Christian virtue, looks at sharing as a very, very critical thing. And maybe as we talk about, as we talk about this, uh, we should be able to uh, even practice this even today. And lastly, about religion, African culture, uh, religion is part of the African people. Religiosity, spirituality, religious practices are part of the African people. So religion permeates the entire community and the individual's life. And someone says that Africans are notoriously religious. It is now that some Africans are beginning to be atheists, they are beginning to be not religious people. But traditionally, Africans are very, very religious people. Life is lived ritually. Life is managed ritually. Every aspect of an African life is religiously looked at. At birth, there are religious aspects. When you are growing crops, there are religious aspects. When you are eating food, at every point of life, 
there is a religious aspect. But now here comes a situation where people are trying to run away from religion, in a, even so uh, in Africa here. And then celebrations are very common. Joy is a, is a common response to the presence of God. People celebrate at birth, people celebrate at harvest, people celebrate. Even at death, people celebrate. I remember those days when we were young, we used to, you know, when, especially if it is an elder who has died, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll proudly dance, we'll proudly, you know, celebrate, okay? So people celebrate life. And my friends, I want to say that if you want to live your life well, celebrate every every milestone you make. It's a very beautiful thing from African African culture. But here, celebration is a response to God's goodness. If God has given a child, people celebrate. If God has given a good harvest, people celebrate. If an elder dies and matures to, to, to become an ancestor, people celebrate. So celebration is a common response uh, to the presence of God. And then there is a good relationship between God and ancestors. And the good relationship between God and ancestors determines the well-being of the, of the living. Prosperity, health of the living community, and so on. When people have good relationship with God and ancestors, even the living live well. But if there is a bad relationship, then things like sickness, destruction, death, poverty, uh, and so on will be taking place from time to time. And in Africa, every misfortune has a cause. If there is a misfortune that has happened to me, either an accident or a miscarriage, maybe my wife miscarriages, or maybe I lose a job, or I go to hunt, I don't, I don't, I don't get animals, and so on, poor harvest. All those misfortunes have got causes, and the causes are either moral, either uh, uh, perhaps it could be because of an immoral behavior, or it is a supernatural thing, or it is caused by another human being. So every misfortune has a cause, and that is a very important religious aspect. And lastly, healing is a central aspect of religion in Africa. Healing is a special aspect. No wonder. Even today, if you look at African people, you will find that uh, there is a lot of emphasis put on, even when it comes to Christianity, uh, a lot of emphasis put on healing, because this has been part of us. And so even when we translated away from traditional African society to other religions like Christianity, you will still find that uh, people look at healing more, more important. Now, Maybe uh, let's finish this class by looking at uh, the lessons between the church and culture. Now, the question here is, is culture good or culture is bad? Can, cult can the church associate itself with the culture or the church will dissociate itself from culture? Because the, based on your answer, whether culture is good or bad, should the a Christian, so one who is who is uh, who 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 has adopted the Christ, the Christian faith, put aside culture, is culture should culture still continue to remain part of us? According to Charles Craft, there are four different approaches a Christian can have in relation to culture. Number one, uh, God is against culture. God, is, God does not care about culture. Culture is evil, and therefore uh, culture needs redemption. And therefore, there should be no reason why uh, a, a religious person, a Christian, should associate himself with the culture, uh, because God is against culture. Culture is evil. And cultures must be redeemed because it is evil. That is what... Uh, some people believe that culture is evil, and therefore a Christian should not associate himself with any other culture, more so the African traditional culture. This is maybe some of the reasons why when the missionaries came, they tried to stop us from using our drums for praising God, because they think those are traditional drums, they cannot be used to praise God. And then some people think that God is in a culture, therefore culture is good. 
God is contained in culture. God uses culture to communicate to people. For example, when Jesus Christ was born, he was born in, a, in the Jewish culture. He grew up in the Jewish culture. And sometimes his ministry has a lot of link with, uh, with, uh, with the Jewish culture. Okay? So because of that, some people think God is in the culture. It is God who is the source of culture. It is God who created the culture. Although culture has fallen short of the glory of God because of human sin, but God is the author of culture. Therefore, God is good. I mean, culture is good. And God is containing culture. Now, some people also think that God is above culture. And God is not even concerned about culture. Whether culture is good, whether culture is bad, God is above it. He doesn't even bother about it. That is what some people believe. And lastly, some people believe that uh, God is above culture, but God works through culture. He redeems the culture to fulfill his purposes. So these are the four uh, schools of thoughts. Uh, Charles Craft uh, things that can be a possible uh, way in which we can look at the relationship between the church and the culture. What is your point of view? Where, which school do you take? Number one, God is against culture. Number two, God is in culture. Number three, God is above culture. Or number four, God is above culture, but God works through culture. For me, I think definitely culture is good, but there are aspects of culture which doesn't please God. I also believe that culture needed to be redeemed, especially where it doesn't uh, glorify God, where it falls source of the glory of God, it has to be redeemed. I also believe that God can use culture to minister to people. So, uh, what is your view? Uh, we can finish this class by looking at the following discussion questions. And I, I just want to present these questions here. You can take your own time to look at these questions. You can take your own time uh, to see how you, you can keep discussing this question. But the question is, with the increase in globalization, many people argue that Africa is at a crossroad. Many people believe that the African people are at crossroads. So the question here is, discuss how globalization has hurt the traditional African worldview. How has globalization negatively affected the traditional African worldview? The second discussion question is uh, the traditional African worldview and way of life is outdated and has no place in the 21st century with the relevant examples elucidate on this statement. That is where uh, we shall stop today. And I want to thank you for attending to this class. I know, I, as I told you, this is a recorded video. So you can, you can attend to this class many times and you can attend to this class at any time you want. Even when you're in the kitchen, when you're in the bedroom, when you're in the sitting room. But ensure that at least you have, you have an ample time. You ensure that you have a time when you can, uh, you can, you can, uh, you, when you're in a quiet place, you have a notebook. When you, when you watch this video, make sure that you, you're in a quiet place where you can, you, you, are, you are able to, you, you really feel like you're in a class. Otherwise, thank you so much. Uh, I will keep doing this, but sometimes we'll have live classes for today. We'll stop there. Bye.